Good morning. Welcome everyone to the Insider Briefing from the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation. I'm Dr. Eric Jolly, President and CEO of the Foundation, and it is my privilege to welcome our donor advice fund holders and our professional advisors. This is our first virtual professional advisor insider briefing. We are so happy for those of you who have been able to join us on this uh, beautiful uh, opportunity to learn more about the, the talk of the town, our 2020 elections and beyond. Um, we are delighted to be trusted partners with so many of you as our uh, professional advisors to work closely with you, your clients, and uh, examine the ways in which together we can help create a better Minnesota. I'm also delighted for those donor advice fund holders who were able to join us today. Thank you. It has been an incredible time since um, the beginning of our uh, difficulties with coronavirus. We have watched our donors, our partners, all across the state step up at a level of unexpected generosity to really open their hearts and get engaged in making our community better. Uh, at the very beginning of this, the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation partnered with the Minnesota Council on Foundations and leading over 20 additional nonprofit and foundation partners. We've been managing the funds for the Minnesota Disaster Recovery Fund. And we've been actively engaged with our governors and uh, mayors around town, the other leaders, in helping to help Minnesota plan the movement from relief to recovery to help us get through this very troubling time of isolation. It was in the middle of that, of course, that we had the intensity of uh, response to the murder of George Floyd. Um, and we saw our cities and our state coming to terms with issues of race, racism, and um, uh, challenges to the very fabric of our society. The St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation was there for that as well. And beyond simply managing the economic recovery funds, almost eight of them for different aspects of, of community that were injured by this, we have helped bring people into our community to provide relief and healing. We have sponsored coaches for those who have led us towards more peaceful resolutions. We have sponsored the African American Leadership Forum in managing community conversations. We're helping bring our community together with possibilities. And so we're delighted to have been the focal point for so many people who wanted to use their community foundation as an avenue for change and for good. Through our work, we have managed relief funds for the mayors. We have managed partnerships with the uh, Greater Twin Cities United Way and the Minneapolis Foundation together with the St. Paul and uh, Minnesota Foundation. We are leading efforts to look at um, corrections reform and our prison reform and so many other things that will be important for us to move forward, including police reform. We have worked with um, connected Minnesota. And as we lead that fund, uh, that effort for managing funds for so many other generous partners, we're helping to find ways to get our students engaged and connected through um, internet and other services for their educational programs, and even helping our rural communities across the state engage for health care through the internet access. And so partnerships have been really the key thing to building our community uh, through these disasters that we've been facing. And among those partners, unbelievable generosity of our donor advice fund holders and our philanthropic advisors who knew to call us and say, where can we invest for good? Um, so thank you all for joining us and for being a part of our efforts to make our state whole and help us recover through these double tragedies. We're preparing another way to recover from our tragedies, and that is to look at what kind of leadership will take this country and this state forward for the next four years. And to help us do that, uh, we are going to be joined by Dr. David Schultz uh, for a presentation on Minnesota, the 2020 election and beyond. Um, 
Dr. David Schultz is Professor of Political Science and of Legal Studies at Mitchell Hamlin University. Uh, he is a three-time Fulbright Scholar who has uh, lectured throughout Europe and Asia, taught intensely uh, uh, to interested international audiences. He is the winner of the prestigious Whittington Award for Public Affairs Teaching. It's a national award. Um, his more than 35 books, over 200 scholarly articles, focusing on American politics, election law, media and politics. Dr. David Schultz is a nationally renowned speaker. He is someone you're reading uh, quotes from across the world from major media events. They turn to him to understand what's happening nationally and internationally. And today, we have the pleasure of being joined by him to learn what's happening in Minnesota, the 2020 election and beyond. Welcome, Dr. David Schultz. Great, and thank you very much for a wonderful introduction. And just a little bit of mechanics here. I'm gonna be talking about my title today, as it says, Minnesota, you know, in 2020 and beyond, but I'm gonna to try to um, really sort of connect a lot of different things together in terms of our discussion today. Um, you're free to sort of pose questions to me as I'm speaking, but I'm also gonna make sure I leave enough space at the end of my presentation so that if you wanna ask questions, um, we can do that also. All right, so what I wanna do today is to cover a, a wide range of different issues here. And where I'm gonna start with our discussion, just to give you kind of sort of the, the overview right now. I wanna start and talk a little bit about, about polarization in America, because I know many people are concerned about that issue. I'm gonna walk from polarization to then talk about the polls um, in terms of what we should be thinking about in terms of the polls right now, because a lot of us are, 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 are focused on those. Again, while many of us understand while 2020 is an important election year, I wanna put it in a broader context in terms of why um, and what are some of the ramifications regarding 2020 and beyond. Then I'm gonna look at a little bit how um, the pandemic and, uh, and George Floyd, uh, as I'm gonna argue, how both changed everything and changed nothing when it came to American politics. Um, and then speculate a little bit on, on again, what this election is gonna look like in the next, in, in what, barely 60 days and then take us beyond 2020. What, what I also wanna do here, and I wanna give you all four numbers right now. Everything that you need to know about the 2020 election comes down to four numbers, and I'm gonna explain them eventually. Those four numbers are 10, 11, 7, 270. I'll repeat that again. Everything you need to know about this presidential election comes down to 10, 11, 7, 270, right? I'll eventually explain those and tie it all together. All right, so I give a lot of talks um, in the course of a year. In the last two or three years, four years, among the most frequent questions that are posed to me when I start to talk about American politics, somebody will raise their hand in exasperation and say, isn't this the most polarized we've ever been in American history? And I'll pause and I say, well, no, um, the Civil War beat the heck out of this. Or I'll point out and say, I hope we don't go back to that point in the early 1960s where a president was killed, his brother was assassinated, we had a, a civil rights leader assassinated, and we had much of urban America you know, burning. Um, I said, I hope we don't get to that point yet, and I'm still hoping we're not anywhere near that. But nonetheless, I said, if your impression is we are more polarized now than we were, let us say, a generation ago, the answer is that's exactly correct. So I want to paint a picture for you, and I want to take a picture that takes us back to approximately 1980. 1980 is a good barometer because it was a presidential election year also, Ronald Reagan versus Jimmy Carter. But why I like 1980 is that it's sort of the beginning of a transformation in American politics that's been occurring for approximately 40 years. Now, if we were to go back to, let's say about 1980, and we wanted to do a public opinion poll of, of, of the American public, find out what they think on a range of issues regarding, let us say, um, um, tax policy, abortion, other social issues, maybe the Cold War. And if we were to take the, the, those responses and plot them on a graph, and especially if we were to plot the responses on the graph, 
in a way that we would plot people out from those who are very, very liberal um, to those who are centrist, to those who are very conservative. If we were to do that kind of a graph, what we would get is something approaching a near perfect bell curve. And you know what a bell curve looks like. It's kind of fat at the top and it kind of winds down to the sides. And that's why we call it kind of a bell curve. And the, and the importance of that bell curve in 1980 is very, very significant. And I'm gonna eventually contrast it to where we are in 2020 and explain why all this is important. So if we were to look at American public opinion back in 1980, we formed a bell curve. Now I'm gonna teach you a little bit of political science today also. Take a line and draw it down the dead center of that curve. That would be the dead center where half the respondents are on one side, half the respondents on the other. In political science, we would call that halfway point the median voter. And what that means, if we're plotting out voting from the most conservative to the most liberal, uh, the person in the dead center would be the median, dead center there. And what you'll notice is that with a bell curve like this, most of the voters were in the center. And that is exactly correct circa 1980. Back in 1980, the vast majority of voters would have come in on public opinion surveys as being towards the center. Now, one of the things that's gonna be significant about that, or actually there's gonna be a lot of things that are significant about that convergence towards the center, but one of them, I'm gonna invoke a strange hero. And my hero is Willie Sutton. Willie Sutton was a famous bank robber. And at one time he was asked the question, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where all the money is. And Willie Sutton was a genius in some sense. But think about this now. If the vast majority of voters converge towards the center, towards that median voter, think about it generally in presidential races, what type of candidate would the parties nominate if they wanted to get elected, have their candidate get elected as president? And the answer, of course, is obvious, a centrist candidate. And to a large extent, still in the 70s, and even to some extent up to 1980, the Democratic and Republican parties were electing more centrist type of candidates, those who converged, converged um, towards that median voter. And we would also know that the Democratic and Republican parties, the center of those two parties, would have been pretty close to the, to the, to the, the central median voter also. We also know, and again, I'm gonna teach you a political science term again, that the two political parties were what we call coalitional parties. That is, these were political parties that had um, not an ideological bent per se, but we would look at the Republican and Democratic parties nationally and statewide in Minnesota and find that there would be a mix of what? Liberals, moderates, conservatives in both. So for example, for the Democratic party, you would have had a Ted Kennedy as a liberal. You would have had kind of a Jimmy Carter as a centrist. Um, I'm trying to remember now who would have been one of the sort of the Southern conservatives um, in the Democratic party, um, but we would have had that the uh, Democratic Party. For the Republican Party, you would have, of course, had somebody like a Barry Goldwater, who's very conservative. And we would have had kind of a more liberal person, such as a David Durenberger, um, who's from the state of Minnesota. So the parties were, were far more coalitional. And this is important also because why? If the parties were more coalitional, less ideological driven, it created a recipe to make it easier for the two political parties to cooperate and work together. They weren't divided ideologically. Now, a couple of other characteristics of 1980, then I'm gonna bring us to the present. Within that bell curve, as I told you, of where most of the voters converge towards the center with these coalitional parties, we also know a couple of other interesting things. That of the 435 seats in the US House of Representatives, approximately one third or about 120 of those seats came from swing districts. And what I mean by swing districts, these are districts that were neither certainly gonna vote Republican or certainly vote Democratic in an election, but in any given election, they could vote Democrat or Republican because Democrats and Republicans among the voters were relatively evenly balanced. There were enough undecided voters. The importance of those swing districts 
was that at a time um, in the, let's say the seventies up until even the early eighties, neither the Democrats nor the Republicans had enough votes to do whatever they wanted solely on a straight party line vote. They needed swing votes. They needed swing seats. Those swing congressional districts were the drivers of political compromise. Think about it. If you were too liberal, too, too conservative in one of those districts, too much consistently favored one party as opposed to another, you were probably out of office the next time. And then finally, in 1980, between 10 and 15% of the voters were what we called swing voters. And these were voters who might, let's say, vote Republican for president, like they did for, for Ronald Reagan, and maybe vote for a Democrat for governor or, or split ticket in other ways, or one election might vote Democrat, one election might vote Republican. Those were our characteristics. Again, the bell curve, the median voter, the coalitional parties, the 120 swing congressional seats, the, the 10 to 15% swing voters. What it yielded is that most legislation in Congress was bipartisan. And if productivity is any indication of anything, uh, Congress was incredibly productive in terms of amount of legislation it passed. Now, take that model, take that bell curve that I've described to you. Fast forward now to 2020. And in 2020, imagine I step on the center of that bell curve, kind of like my, I stepped on it like with my foot and it shoots the two sides out. Or if that doesn't help, imagine a double hump camel's back. And the reason why I say that, that's American public opinion now. It is bimodal. If we were to ask the American public questions now about the major issues of the day, taxes, um, um, uh, the pandemic, for example, um, the economy, um, so forth, we now plot this out from liberal to conservative. We would find one hump goes down in the center, another hump comes up. What has happened is that the percentage of voters who, who actually are moderates in the center has gone down. Now, everybody I know likes to say they're a moderate, but in reality, when we look at their voting preferences and how they vote, um, it no, it's no longer the case. And more importantly, because it's a double hump now, what has happened is that voters have sorted themselves out. And that what we've seen over time is a sorting out up to where now the two major political parties are not coalitional, they are ideological. That we no longer see, for example, uh, moderates, or rather I should, I should say this, conservatives in the Democratic Party or liberals in the Republican Party. They have sorted themselves out. Um, again, to give you a great story here with a Minnesota connection, back in 2008, um, I was giving a lecture at the University of St. Thomas. I was an invited guest there. And, and David Durenberger, some of you might recall, was a Republican senator at one point. And he came to my talk because David and I are friends. And we're in the reception line after my talk. And we're getting like, you know, whatever the snacks are, cheese and crackers or something to drink. And Senator Durenberger turns to me and he says, I don't know if I should have my snacks here or at my next reception. And I said, Senator, where's your next reception? And he said, I'm going to a Barack Obama fundraiser. And I looked at him and I said, what the heck are you doing going to that fundraiser? You're a Republican. And he said, yeah, but my party's walked away from me. I don't feel comfortable there. I've heard other Republicans say that about the Democratic Party. I've heard other Democrats say that, or former Democrats say that about the Republican Party. The parties have sorted themselves out. Um, ideologically now. We rarely see, in fact, we don't see that mixture that we had before. And we'll talk about why that's important in a couple of minutes here. So we now, we've got a double hump curve. The centers of the two parties are moving farther and farther apart. I still think Willie Sutton is a genius. Remember he said, why does he rob banks? Because that's where all the money is. If you're now a polit major political party, Democratic, Republican, are you going to nominate a centrist to be your candidate? Heck no, there's no voters there. You nominate a candidate near the center of your party. And with the centers of the two parties moving further and further and further apart, that speaks to the polarization. We also know in 2020 that the number of swing congressional districts is not 120, it's about 60. 
There are fewer swing districts. We've sorted ourselves out, which means fewer seats that are drivers of political compromise. Additionally, that 10 to 15% swing voter has evaporated. At best, it's five to 10%, maybe even less. Um, there are some people, and I'm one of them, who argues we no longer have swing voters in the traditional model of split ticket voting or voting one year Democrat, Republican the next year. To be a swing voter now means do you swing in and show up to vote, swing out and not vote? That's significant. Just give you a comparison. In 2016, at this time of the election four years ago, about 14% of the voters were undecided regarding Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. This time right now, we're at about what? 4% of the population that's undecided. And I don't think it's because they're undecided and they don't know who Donald Trump is or Joe Biden is. It's what? They haven't decided if they're gonna show up and vote or not show up and vote. That's a different notion of swing voters. It's about less being able to persuade people to move them to your side than it is to hope that, guess what? I hope they just don't vote if they don't vote for me. And among the most important swing voters, in fact, the most important swing voter in America, as well as in Minnesota, are college-educated suburban women. They drive American politics. In 2016, those suburban women largely stayed home um, and didn't vote for, for, um, for Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump won. I'll come back and talk about this later on. In 2018, I'm sorry, 2018, those suburban women showed up to vote and helped Democrats in Minnesota and across the country. For those of you who want to get a better sense of who I'm referring to, back in 2018, about two weeks before the election, I went to Minnetonka High School to speak to high school students about the election. And I said to them, you realize your moms are the most important voters in America. And all the students looked at me like, what do you mean my mom's important? I know she is, but why? And I said, it's college educated women like your, like your mothers who really drive everything in American politics. And we're gonna to wanna to think about this, all right? So think about the shifts from 20, or rather from 1980 to 2020, the shift in the bell curves, the shift in swing voters, the shift in the number of, of, of swing congressional seats. What we know now is what? Because of the polarization, the, per, um, the percentage of, of votes that are straight party line is unprecedented almost no bipartisan legislation. We also know that the amount of legislation being passed has gone down dramatically. If we were to plot this out now, the most liberal voting Republican in the House of Representatives is still what? Voting more conservatively than the most conservative Democrat. There's no overlap between the parties. No overlap means ideological overlap, means difficulty in terms of being able to cooperate. By the way, the same pattern persists in Minnesota. We've seen the same ideological sorting out of the DFL and the GOP. In fact, Minnesota is a near perfect microcosm of the United States right now, that we have the only state legislature that's split between Republican and Democrat. We've got the geography of Democrats and Republicans nationwide. Democrats are what? urban, inner ring suburb, Republicans, outer ring suburb, rural areas, same thing in Minnesota. Just again, to speak to how polarized we are, this is important to my broader talk here. Um, I'll give you a couple of other great tidbits to depict how polarized we are in America, as well as in Minnesota. In 2016, the best predictors of how areas we're gonna vote, proximity to Whole Foods stores, Chick-fil-A restaurants or Cracker Barrel restaurants. They were near perfect predictors or twisted a different way. You tell me what car you drive, what store you shop at, what restaurants you frequent, and I can make near perfect predictions on your voting behavior. If you tell me you drive a Subaru, I know exactly how you're going to vote. You tell me you shop at Gander Mountain, I know exactly how you're going to vote. If you tell me you drive your Subaru to Gander Mountain, then I have a difficulty making a prediction. But that speaks to how polarized we are. Democrats and Republicans have geographically, let's say also 
not just politically, but geographically, news consumption wise, store consumption wise, all spread themselves out. And that has implications for understanding something about American politics today and why we do or don't get things done. Second major topic, briefly. I have so many people when I give talks to say, my gosh, the polls were completely wrong four years ago. How can we believe them? And the answer was the polls were actually exactly right four years ago. The national polls going into the election said that Secretary Clinton would win the election by about two to three percentage points, plus or minus a couple, and they were exactly right. She did, she won it exactly. The point being is that ignore now all national polls that you see about the presidential election, why? We don't elect on the basis of the popular vote. It is what? The Electoral College. Here's the first number I want you to remember. The Electoral College is not the race to get the most popular vote. It's to get a majority of the 538 electoral votes that are being cast. A majority is what? 270. Everything is a race to get to 270 electoral votes. If you really want to pay attention to things, you have to look at what? State polling. And even four years ago, state polls were accurate. But more so this year, most of the pollsters have adjusted their polls in light of four years ago, where four years ago, college education or having a college education wasn't viewed as a critical variable um, for polling in terms of questions to ask or sorting as it is considered now. So the polling data, I think, is still pretty accurate. So for people who are saying we're going to be completely surprised by the polls, <clears throat> the answer is they weren't wrong four years ago. Who got it wrong were the analysts who misread the polls. All right. Now, why is 2020 important? Obviously, it's about the presidential election. It's also about the fact that the U.S. Senate um, is, in, is in play. There are 35 Senate seats in play at this point, 23 held by Republicans, the remainder by Democrats. Republicans hold a 53-47 lead. If I were giving this talk, let us say, three months ago, even two months ago, I would have said to you, there's almost no chance that the Democrats have in terms of flipping the Senate and winning. It's still a tough haul. Best guesses are now, maybe the Democrats get to 51-49, or maybe it goes 50-50. And if it goes 50-50, then the vice president gets to break the ties according to the Constitution. In terms of the U.S. House of Representatives, Almost nobody is predicting that the Democrats are going to lose the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, they have a pretty good margin now. Some are speculating they might even pick up a few additional seats. So it remains that way. Having said that, even if by some chance Joe Biden were to win, and he's got a chance to win, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes here, or if Donald Trump were to win, no matter what's going to happen, let's say even if the Republicans sweep everything again or the Democrats sweep everything this time, we're probably going to be still be facing gridlock at the national level because what? The Senate is still driven by the filibuster. You still need 60 votes to break those filibusters. No one's envisioning the Republicans or the Democrats of getting to the magical number 60. So in part, if you like a lot of the gridlock that we see right now, you're going to still love the next few years. Also, don't forget this election, the control of state houses are important. That right now Republicans have about a 51% control of state legislative seats across the country to about a 48, and I think it's about a 1% um, that's independent um, or, or non-political or, or, or non-partisan at this point. Um, who controls state legislative seats are important for what? State public policy for, for issues like what we're going to see coming Friday in Minnesota. Again, all about an, a fourth special session and what's going to happen. Um, but also because, next point, this is, a, this is a year to do the census. Next year is the year to do redistricting. And who controls the state legislatures gets to drive the redistricting process. But in a different direction? why this is important this year too. This is the beginning of the end of the baby boomer era of politics. For the last 30 years, baby boomers have been the largest generational voting block in America. 
And with this election, the baby boomers um, start to, and I use the nice word, exit the political system. There's a not, not so nice word to describe this too. But now millennials and Gen Z will compose 37% of the electorate. They still don't vote their weight, but we're seeing the balance of power, the baton, whatever metaphor I wanna use, pass from one generation to another. That's significant. And then of course, I'm gonna come back to this, that this is an election that's important because, because of, of how elections have policy consequences. And what happens this year has policy consequences next year in terms of what the federal government and what states do. Right. Now, imagine, imagine I was giving this talk, let's say five months ago, and one of you said to me, well, Professor Schultz, what's the most important issue that's driving the 2020 election? And I would have said to you, well, gosh, it's probably gonna be how the failed impeachment of Donald Trump and the trial in the Senate plays out in the election. Do you all remember the fact that the president was impeached and we had a trial about seven months ago? None of us remember that, but that was the big issue. None of us would have talked about how the economy was a big issue at that point in terms of a liability. We would have said that what? The economy is doing reasonably well, although for reasons that I will mention before this talk finishes, um, we had problems even back then, but that wouldn't have been an issue. The issue that would have been the major issue for the 2020 election was what? Donald Trump. He was the issue. In 2016, when we had the election, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, according to all the polling data going back forever, were the two least popular candidates to run for president ever. Both had disapprovals of 60%. A different 60% might have disliked both of them, but nonetheless, highly unpopular. That election in many ways was a referendum on Secretary Clinton and people didn't like her and she lost. Now, also people wanna talk about this, there were incredible sexism questions that were there too, that I think also affected um, that election. But we had lots of different things going on that it was an election that was all about what? A referendum on Hillary Clinton. Um, and I'm gonna answer a couple of questions, by the way, in a second here that people have posed for me, okay? Um, but what's happened is that in 2016, if it was a referendum on Hillary Clinton, 2020, or rather 2018, it was a referendum on Donald Trump. And that referendum on Donald Trump did what? It brought suburban women out to vote in ways they didn't come out to vote in 2016. Their dislike of Donald Trump, disliking of the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, um, a whole bunch of different things all, all led to that. And that leads us to wondering, of course, um, to what extent will 26, or rather 2020 be a rerun of 2016 or a rerun of 2018? That's something we need to think about. But six months ago, we would have not been talking about the coronavirus. We would have not been talking about the economy. Uh, uh, we would have been talking about what? we would have been talking about a referendum on Donald Trump. I still think that 2020 is a referendum on Donald Trump. The, the coronavirus, the economy are surrogate issues for how we think about him. Think about the fact of how we partisanly um, disagree over the wearing of face masks, how we judge um, um, the economy, all signs that what? Um, that on one level, the coronavirus um, has, has now changed things because what? On one level, it's changed it because we're talking about the virus, but still, I think the virus is a surrogate for, for Donald Trump. Where coronavirus is changing things is in terms of, of how we vote. And again, we could talk more about that maybe in Q&A in terms of pushing us to where we're gonna be significantly online and how this plays out. Because with Donald Trump having disparaged, um, uh, um, not online, we, in, in, by mail, I meant to say, with Donald Trump having disparaged um, mail voting, um, there's evidence that what, it might be invigorating Democrats to vote that way, depressing Republicans from voting that way, and how does that play out? And again, we should think about that and also what it means on election day. And I'll come back to that, election day versus early voting. So I'm gonna argue that the coronavirus changed everything and changed nothing. It's changed everything about voting, added a new issue, changed nothing in the sense of what? That, that it's still about Donald Trump. 
And it's the same thing that I'm going to get to my three questions here before I move on. I'm going to argue George Floyd changed everything and perhaps changed nothing also. Is that clearly what happened to George Floyd uh, was a tragedy. It put race back dead center into American politics to think about it again. It should have never disappeared. Uh, I mean, race has been the issue, uh, or one of the major issues in America from the beginning. Um, we just stopped talking about it in, in the last generation, if not longer. Uh, and and his, his death put that back on the agenda, which again, should have been, but then it also put on the agenda the aftermath of, of, the, of the George Floyd um, death, which is not just the demonstrations, but it put what? Black Lives Matters, the rioting, um, it put a whole bunch of other things on the agenda. And that has now transformed the election to where we've got the issue of race, the issue of law and order playing out, which we hadn't seen um, before the pandemic. So again, it changed everything, George Floyd, and perhaps changed nothing in the sense that, that I'm also not sure that George Floyd dramatically moved too many voters or the or the the post demonstrations or the rioting changed too many views but moved just a few okay so a few questions here then i'll get on further here what caused the shift from the center to the edges over the past 40 years there's several different things and one of them might be the subject of another briefing i do for you which is what a generational shift in american politics over the last 40 years the greatest generation, the World War II generation um, has exited. We're seeing the exiting of the silent generation, um, the exiting of the baby boomers, the rise of the millennials, um, Gen Z. And I know some people are gonna be upset that I don't men mention Gen X, but yes, they're, they're coming in. That's part of it. Changes in the economy have driven this, changes in technology. But from my perspective, it's that generational cohort replacement. And with that, we have also, as I said, sorted ourselves out geographically. Um, we don't like, as a Democrat, to live near Republicans or vice versa. There's evidence that Democrats and Republicans have very different lifestyle choices, geography choices, housing choices. Um, and that's led to the, what's called the big sort. Okay, another question. Why do the polls show Minnesota is a swing state in the presidential election when Democrats hold every constitutional office in both Senate seats? Is there something different about presidential elections? I'm gonna to come to that in about five minutes, Alan, I'll come back. Okay, question, did I foresee, um, pre, uh, did I foresee President Trump's victory in 16? What do you foresee happening in 2020? Okay, I'll answer part of it now. If you Google my name uh, and Minnesota School Boards Association, in 2015, December of 2015, before the Iowa caucuses started, I gave a talk over at the Double Tree in St. Louis Park for the Minnesota School Boards Association. And someone said, well, can you make some predictions on what's gonna happen in the election? And I said, yes. I said, Hillary Clinton's gonna get the nomination. That was an easy one. And I said that Donald Trump would win the Republican nomination. Someone then said, well, who's gonna win the general election? And I said, Donald Trump will win, will win the election. And then in July of 2016, I refined it and said that Hillary Clinton would win the popular vote and Donald Trump would win the electoral vote. And that's largely what happened. Okay, uh, going here also, um, do you think, and I'm gonna get to 2020 in a few minutes here. Okay, do you think domestic race relations have eclipsed or overshadowed immigration as the election issue? Yes, there's no question about it. That, that I think, or let me put it this way, immigration, race relations um, for many people are blurred together. And I think for Donald Trump, he has put them together. Um, it is about, and we have to be honest here, you know, he's running a campaign where his strongest supporters are white working class America without a college degree. I mean, to some extent, um, we are in the middle of a powerful era of of identity politics. And I'm gonna argue that both sides are running on identity politics. Um, do you think we'd be as polarized today as we are without the social media? It's clearly added um, gas to a polarization that's already occurs. Um, and I gotta get, um, it's already enhanced that, that polarization um, where we now are even more in our bubbles than before. Uh, and we're in our, our, our media bubbles, 
our social media bubbles and so forth. I'm going to get to sort of the predictions for 2020 and beyond in a couple minutes here. Okay, so let me now remind you again, the polls don't matter. I'm going to get to the economy too in a couple seconds here, about, two, about three or four minutes. Okay, when we think about the election, remember, it's not about the national polls. Remember, it's about the race to get to 270 electoral votes. That what we want to do is think about where the election is today. All right, now, remember, polls are not predictors. Polls are snapshots in time. According to my best estimates right now, what we know um, is that there are 43 states in this country that the election is over. And we knew this in a, a long time ago. Because of the Electoral College's winner take all, I can tell you right now what's gonna happen in New York, California, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and a total of 43 states. They're so overwhelmingly Democratic or so overwhelmingly Republican that we know exactly what's gonna happen. So right now, I start with the argument that says Joe Biden has right now 222 electoral votes. Remember, you need 270 to win. He's got 222. Donald Trump has 205. There are seven states, Arizona, Florida, Michigan, Minnesota, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Those seven states totaling 111 electoral votes. Those are the seven swing states that are gonna determine everything. Um, someone's gonna have to win enough remaining electoral votes there to pull off the election. And what we're gonna see is how between now and election day, and by the way, election day, the ballots have already been mailed out in North Carolina and early voting starts in Minnesota on September 18th. The elections are upon us now. Um, that we're going to have to see how, um, or we're going to see how candidates are campaigning in those seven swing states. So notice if I've given you 270 is my first number, seven is another number. Seven states are going to decide the election. But I'm going to show you how polarized we are and point out that guess what? Within those seven states, and this is the research that I do, there are only certain counties that candidates go to to campaign because in each of those seven states, there are critical swing counties that drive the election. So for example, in Arizona, a swing state, whoever wins Maricopa County, Phoenix, wins the election. In Florida, it's gonna come down to Hillsborough, Pinellas counties. In Michigan, Wayne County. In Minnesota, perhaps Hennepin and Candiohi counties um, as possibilities, although I have a couple others I might substitute instead. In North Carolina, it's Wake County. In Pennsylvania, it's Bucks and Lackawanna. Wisconsin, it's Brown and Milwaukee counties. What I am arguing, there's probably only 11 counties, and we know this from campaign activities in the last few years, that the candidates only go to the swing states, they only go to the swing counties. And within those swing counties, there's only a small number of voters, maybe 10% of the voters in those counties that actually determine the election. Thus, this election comes down to what? 10% of the voters in 11 counties dispersed across seven states that determine who gets to 270 electoral votes. If I put this in real numbers, three years ago, or four years ago, I'm sorry, four years ago in 2016, in three states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and, and Michigan, a, a shift of 85,000 votes, and Secretary Clinton is running for re-election at this point. What happened then was something fascinating. It wasn't that Donald Trump got more, way more votes than Mitt Romney did four years earlier. It's Democrats stayed home. They stayed home in critical Democratic counties. They also, including in Minnesota, um, the downturn was, was big. Trump only gets 2,000 more votes in Minnesota in 16 than Romney got in 12. The difference was voters in Hennepin County especially and Ramsey County, less or so, stayed home on election day. Democrats stayed home. Remember, it's all about mobilization. It's all about suburban voters showing up to vote or not showing up to vote. But I'm going to make it even better here. I worked with a high school student who interned with me last summer. We looked at precincts across the United States. It may be what? Only a few swing precincts 
of swing voters and a few swing precincts and a few swing counties and a few swing states that might matter. I am not quite to the point of saying how Fred and Ethel vote on Elm Street in a particular county in a swing state drive the election, but that speaks to how polarized we are. Or two other examples. Four years ago, I did a piece called As Scranton Goes, So Goes the Country. Scranton, Scranton, Pennsylvania is Lackawanna County. And, and I argued that Lackawanna County, a place where Joe Biden is from, Hillary Clinton's family was from there. And by the way, my mother's family was from there. So I know Lackawanna County well, is a traditionally blue collar mining working class area that Democrats have generally won by double digits, 20 points or more. I said that if Trump won that county or got close, he would win Pennsylvania. If he won Pennsylvania, he would win the country. Clinton only won Lackawanna County by two points. Trump wins Pennsylvania, wins the election or I get to do my only joke of the day. Perhaps the most important county in Wisconsin is, is Brown County. Many analysts are saying that Wisconsin could decide the election. That's how close it is. For those of you who don't know, Brown County is where what? Where Green Bay is. My one joke, for those of you who are Minnesota Vikings fans, if Brown County is the key to the election this year, then guess what? Packers fans decide who becomes president of the United States. And if you're a Vikings fan, you probably don't want to hear that. Okay. Having said all of that, right now, I put the race where even though Nate Silver, 538, are saying 71% chance for, for, um, for Biden to win based on existing polls, I put it at closer to being 50-50. Um, well, she's from Park Ridge, but her family, her family originally was from, 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 from the Scranton area. I think it was on the Rodham side. Uh, I think that's where it was, yeah, from the Rodham side. Part of it was originally from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, so my relatives in Pennsylvania love this. You know, they think the world revolves around Scranton, PA now. Um, uh, but anyhow, um, I think the election's closer to 50-50. Um, um, it's going to tighten up quite a bit. Um, I think it's going to come down to probably um, about a small handful of states. Um, Wisconsin, I think Minnesota are going to be critical. Uh, and why is Minnesota swing, even though it keeps electing statewide um, for um, for all for all Democrats? Well, there's um, there's something different with Donald Trump. Donald Trump has a loyalty, a fidelity that other Republicans don't have. And he is counting on the fact that what? He can get his base to come out and he's hoping that he gets a rerun of four years ago where, where Democrats don't show up um, to vote as much. Now, partly why Minnesota was so close four years ago is Hillary Clinton made some strategic errors. You might recall in the caucuses, Bernie Sanders beats her two to one. She never comes back to campaign here at all. Much in the same way she didn't campaign in Wisconsin after being beat by Sanders and also in Michigan. She took Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin for granted, lost two of those, almost lost the third. Trump has put a lot in hoping that he could flip Minnesota. Part of it, he thinks that, gosh, four years ago, had he made one more campaign visit to Minnesota, he would have won the state. Minnesota has the characteristics right now of states that have swung for Republican. We have a high percentage of white working class without a college degree. I know many of you may be in the, in the bubble of the Twin Cities, but get out beyond the Twin Cities. Um, the signs for Trump are dramatic. And so it's possible. But even if Minnesota's truly not swing, Trump's going to force Biden to defend the state. Every dollar spent here by the Democrats is one dollar less spent in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. So I think the arc, the arc of campaigning for the next few weeks is going to be an arc. Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Yes, we're going to see Pennsylvania, rather I'm going to say North Carolina, Florida, and maybe Arizona um, in play. I'm not sure they're as much in play as people think. I know there are some Democrats who are salivating, thinking, ah, Georgia and Texas are in play now. They could flip. Okay. 
I think it's about one election cycle too early. I lived and taught in Texas for many years. Um, it's changing, but not that rapidly yet to where I think it truly is, is a state that can flip. Okay, so having said that, I think um, it's about 50-50. Uh, I think a lot depends on how good um, how good the campaign is, because unlike many predictors who seem to think campaigns and elections don't matter, I think candidates' messages, I think strategies matter. And I don't think that Woodward's book is going to have much of an impact whatsoever. Uh, how many other books have there been that have been, what, the bombshells um, about, about him? People forgot about Michael Cohen's book just, it's just come, it's just come out also. I think for Trump supporters, they've made up their mind. Nothing is going to change them. For Trump opponents, nothing has changed their mind. For the few voters who are undecided, maybe the book matters. But where I really think it matters, again, it's turnout. Who shows up to vote? How enthusiastic are the voters? The Trump supporters are more enthusiastic for Trump than the Democratic supporters are for Biden. I think where there is some give in the system is that among the elderly, um, they're concerned about the coronavirus and the president's handling of it. This is potentially where the revelations about Trump um, and the coronavirus might play out, but, but, I'm, but I'm not guaranteeing. All right, so that's the presidential prediction. I gave you also and said, I think the Senate um, is about dead even U.S. Senate at this point. I think about the vets. There's some evidence that the vets are going to move, um, and that again could move, but again, we're talking about not what vets overall do, what elderly overall do. What do they do in those critical seven swing states? It all comes down to the logic of small numbers in a small few communities out here. Again, I mentioned to you, I think the U.S. Senate, 50-50 um, chance that it goes 50-50. Um, the Democrats don't have a lock on that. The U.S. House of Representatives stays Democratic. As I mentioned to you, that means what? probably policy gridlock, um, no matter who gets to be elected president, uh, which also means uh, for public policy reasons, we're not going to see, I think, dramatic shifts that are going on. Um, if the Democrats and Biden do take control, we're going to see what? Probably some additional monies in terms of coronavirus, health care. We might see some tinkering with tax policy, um, but but we're not going to see a fundamental wholesale change, I think, in a tax, tax policy being being done. And certainly, and I know this is a concern to the foundations, is that, you know, the last major tax changes a couple of years ago um, changed the deductibles, which have had some impact in terms of um, donor giving across the country. I'm not sure we're going to see much of a change in that. Uh, I think what Biden will be able to accomplish if he were to get elected um, is, is marginal shifts, marginal changes of where we are. Um, if Trump were to stay elected, we're more or less going to have the status quo. So I don't foresee the, the plate tectonics that some people do um, if we were to see even a Democratic sweep. At Minnesota, I'm going to be done in about a minute and a half here, so I have some time for questions here. Um, at the state level, of course, Governor Waltz is not up for election. Um, at the state level, um, I think the Democrats hold the Minnesota House of Representatives. Again, it would take quite a bit to move on that. I know the DFL is confident that they're going to take control of the Minnesota Senate. Um, I'm not so persuaded by that, that the Democrats are going to lose a couple of rural areas. They're going to pick up a couple suburban, even though right now um, the divide is only, what, three votes between them. I think the Democrats need a net pickup of five seats um, in the Senate to be able to win. Um, and I just don't see that many seats in play for all the reasons I've talked about before. Okay, last couple of thoughts here is, is that even before the pandemic hit, there were certain troubling signs on the economy. Wall Street was doing well, but corporate profits were slowing. Um, 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 savings rates had gone down. We saw that there was an emergence of, 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 of real estate bubbles. We were seeing that consumer confidence was dropping. We were seeing also, and I think that there are some signs out there, U.S. consumer debt was higher now than it was in 2008 total student debt at $1.8 trillion. Corporate debt was at 48% um, of the GDP um, compared to 44% in, in 2008. There were lots of signs that the economy was struggling and wages were not going up. 
So, so back then we had some not so good signs, even back in February this year of problems with the economy, the coronavirus, the pandemic has only exacerbated that. Okay, as I draw to a conclusion here, as I was mentioning, generally, um, I don't see any major changes in terms of, of policy um, that are gonna occur because what? We're basically a polarized gridlock country. Um, what happens to the economy if Biden wins? Um, again, there may be more money for bailouts. I think the state of Minnesota is counting on a massive bailout um, um, to address its budget deficit. I also don't see um, um, any kind of major structural reform in terms of getting rid of the Electoral College because the consensus is not there. But I do want to leave you with a couple of final thoughts here and still hopefully a couple of minutes for questions here is that go look at the Credit Suisse report on, on wealth from 2019. It came out late last year. And what it pointed to was that there was an enormous baby, baby boomer millennial wealth gap that millennials at this time of their life are less wealthy than baby boomers are or at, their t at, the, at the same age many years ago. This portends that going down the line, the amount of disposable income that millennials and Gen Zs have for donors and for giving is gonna be dramatically less than we saw in the past. Last question here, and then see if anybody else wants to ask me questions. How do we break this gridlock and start acting as a nation once again? Um, well, again, part of a longer talk is as one gen, as as the baby boomers and the silence exit and the millennials and the Gen Zs replace them, we're going to see in about ten years um, a new political consensus. As we become a less religious country, and there's all evidence that we are, we're going to become more secularized, and social issues will divide us less. Um, so, in some sense, not a lot structurally we can do on our own individual levels. Get out of our bubbles. Talk to people. Um, who are different and travel and visit other people um, across the state and realize that we're not just part, we just can't talk to one another. And the polarized media um, is only one aspect of, of helping to drive that, that hump um, or that camel's hump that we've seen. Okay, so it's 1257. Um, I think I am supposed to now um, turn this over to Luther, but if we have any sort of final questions if anybody wants to ask. Go ahead. Okay, so is there any validity to Trump's claim that mail-in voting invites fraud? No. Um, I've written a lot about voter fraud. Um, your chances of, of showing that voter fraud or, or that fraud through mail-in voting is a serious problem, you've got a better chance of buying a ticket to the Powerball um, and showing that, that you have a better chance of buying a ticket and winning the Powerball than showing that mail-in voting is a problem. That we've got five states with incredible good experience on voter or on, on mail-in voting, there's almost no evidence that it's a problem. All right, so I'm gonna turn this over to, to Luther. Um, and um, thank you very much for having me today. Thank you so much. Um, wow, what a fascinating overview of the election as we head into this final sprint, the final 50 some days. Um, it was so um, wonderful to have you here as an expert. Um, I'm Luther Ranheim. I'm a gift planner at the St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation. And first and foremost, just wanna say thank you on behalf of the foundation and all of us for taking your time to be with us, Dr. Schultz. We really appreciated that informed and interesting and fantastic presentation. I think we're very lucky to have had the opportunity to spend some time with you today. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you for spending your time with us at this insider briefing. We really appreciate you taking advantage of the opportunity to be on this webinar with us. Um, I'd like to call your attention to our uh, upcoming insider briefing on October 22nd at noon. And that is going to be a presentation on estate planning in the time of COVID. So please mark your calendars and look for an email invitation from us in your inbox next week. Again, thank you so much. We hope that you will reach out to us during these times as you have clients that are considering philanthropic planning where we can be helpful in addressing their charitable goals. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a great day. Take care.